Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Takushi Mosawa from Hitachi, and this is my colleague Atsuya Kato. So we're going to talk about this XDA2's vulnerability. So I first explained about the, how the, what is this XDA2's vulnerability? This is a kind of one of the re, recent famous, what infamous uh, vulnerabilities. The, this XDA2's vulnerability, or the XDA2's backdoor, it's a one of the supply chain secu uh, so software supply chain attack. So I like to first begin with the software supply chain. Uh, software supply chain. So maybe you may be familiar well with the, uh, this figure. It's from the documentation of the software framework. So this shows the kind of the workflow in the software supply chain. So the producer creates uh, writes the software source code, and then it builds that source code and then deliver it as a package. And during the build, some dependencies are imported into that software. The, this this um, XAUTU's backdoor involves in the multiple steps in the, this figure because that the source code is compromised and the release files are compromised. And then the software that uses XZUTILs for that such kind of software, the dependencies are compromised. But uh, this XZUTILs backdoor is kind of a little bit different from the other software supply chain attacks because the, as they say here, is an unauthorized change is a kind of one of threats. But in this case, the source code is changed with the authorized right. The reason is that the attacker was a maintainer. So then they would like to go into the details of this XDUTILS backdoor. So first begin with XDUTILS. The XDUTILS is uh, maybe, uh, if you are using the Linux CLI, maybe you may, be use, you may have used that, this one. It's a data compression and decompression library and the tool. It contains XZ executable, the tool, and the library libLZMA. And the, maybe the most common use case of the, this XZ utils is that with the tar command. So if we use the capital J option with the tar, you can compress the tar archive into the, by the XZ, XZ utils, or you can decompress the dot tar dot XZ XZ um, files. The backdoor to the, this program is assigned the number CV2024394. The severity of the, this backdoor is evaluated as a 10.0. That is the highest score. That means that it's the most vulnerable um, vulnerabilities, most severe vulnerability. And in this backdoor, the release tables of XDUTs 5.6.0 and 5.6.1 uh, contain the malicious code. That code is extracted from the disguised uh, test of files during the, its build process, and then it's, it replaces a certain code in the LZMA. That code will work a kind of the backdoors for that the program that link that the LZMA. And what so this, what does the malicious code will do? The malicious code, and this the malicious code, is written in the binary. So actually, that uh, it's not clear that uh, how it is works in the completely. But at least its target was the OpenSSH server. So OpenSSH links to the links the system D or as a library. So it's a lib system D, and then it links. The system D links to the XZUTILS or the library libLZMA. And uh, also that OpenSSH links to the OpenSSL. And when the, this malicious, I mean the compromise the libLZMA is linked to the system D, then the OpenSSH, this malicious code will hijack that, uh, this RSA public decrypt function in the OpenSSL. And this Malicious code hijacks the, this RSA public decrypts, the RSA decryption function, and uh, it executes arbitrary programs with the system function 
when a certain public key is used. So what is caused? So what causes this? Ah, sorry. What results in this? That this backdoor allows the attacker to execute any command in the server that is running this compromised OpenSSH, bypassing the authentication. So if attacker sends a packet with the attacker's public key and the command to execute via network to the server, which run, it is running the, this OpenSSH using a link to the compromised uh, libLZMA. This OpenSSH server will execute this command without authentication. So that means that this attacker can run any program on the server with just sending a packet. So if this OpenSSH server is reachable from the, by the network to the attacker, then he can, they can do the anything on the server. The demonstration code by Anthony Williams is uh, published in this GitHub uh, repository. It's not the same as the vulnerability, this vulnerability, but it demonstrates that the similar things in this um, demonstration code. So what systems are actually affected by the, this backdoor? So the main targets is considered to be the XUT's package published by the Linux distributions. Because that uh, one thing is that the attack code is located inside the test worker files in the repository, but the trigger code that activates the attack code is only included in the release table. And also that the, since the vanilla OpenSSH does not link libsystemd, but uh, so that means that it requires a certain patch applied to the OpenSSH to work. I mean, applied to OpenSSH2 for the, this uh, backdoor to work. And, it, and uh, most distributions applying the, this patch into the, the OpenSSH package. That means that if you are just running the, this um, compromised XUTUS code from the repository, it doesn't work. That, I mean, that, that backdoor does not work. You may have to have the, this satisfy these conditions for the backdoor to work. And that condition is met when the, you are using the distributions package for the OpenSSH and uh, XAUTLs. Yeah. But fortunately, this backdoor was found very fast. So only the, some unstable version of the, the few distributions have published affected packages, like Debian Unstable, Federal Folibero, and the Rawhide. So I think that it's a, you are unlikely to have the, this backdoor between two of your, com your computers. And again, the severity of the vulnerability. So it's evaluated as a 10.0. It is because that it's this score is calculated by the some, uh, some metrics in the here. So the metrics contains attack vector, attack complexity, and so on. So attack vector is a network because it's attackable by a network. And the complexity is low because it just sends a packet. And the privilege is not required and user interaction not required because they're just running the demos. Also the scope has changed and the confidentiality, integrity, availability are all high because that the attacker can execute anything on the computer. That means that they can do anything. So. So this is the all highest, I mean, the severe, most severe combination of the metrics that results in this 10.0 score in the CVSS evaluation. So this is the kind of details of the vulnerability of the backdoor. So the next thing is that how this backdoor is brought into the actual executive releases. So it's very simple. By the, in short, the a maintainer of the exit utils intentionally merged the parties that include the malicious code into the repository and released the forged the tables and released it as a kind of official releases. So there are two people or maybe the main persons that are involved in this um, history. One is Jia Tan. They are the maintainer and maybe the, his there actually an attacker. And the last calling 
is the original maintainer of the XUTs project. So first of all, the XUTs are maintained by this last, call, last calling only. But uh, 2021 October, uh, Geotan appears first in this point, in this time. And the Geotan posted the first patch to the XZ Devil mailing list. This patch was not merged, but it was just a harmless one. And also the one month later, Geotan posted the second patch to the XZ Devil. And this patch was not also uh, merged either, but it's also harmless. And uh, this is just a normal contribution, it looks. And 2022, February, that uh, three months later after he, the Geotan appeared, um, the patch by the Geotan was first merged on the, this 2022 February. That means that the last calling, the maintainer, accepted the patch from the Geotan. And uh, Geotan beginning the contribution to the XUTOs, and then the, at, by the end of the, this year, the December 30, 2022, Jiatan committed directly to the repository for the first time. That means that Jiatan, at this point, Jiatan got access to the repository directly. That means that Jiatan became a maintainer, at least at the latest at this time, at this point. So that means that uh, Jiatan became a maintainer on the end of the 2022. And uh, it is notable that there are many emails from the several persons were sent during the, this contribution time that urges the last calling to merge the attend patches or uh, make them a maintainer. Maybe that these persons are kind of collaborator of the Diatan, or, or it can be the same person. Then, after the Jiatan uh, was main, became a maintainer. Jiatan served as a main, kind of innocent maintainer for the one almost one year. But 2024 February, the first patch that included the Marisa code, the backdoor, was merged by the Jiatan at this point. And then the next day, this code was released as a version 5.6.0. So this is the first version with the backdoor that that's all released. And the two weeks later, 5 .5, version 5.6.1 was released. This is, contains a kind of improved version, improved version of the backdoor. And they also notable that during the, this time, some prerequisite codes are merged into the repository that is submitted by another person. And that persons are these persons who sent that email to push, make, uh, push that to him to the maintainer. But fortunately, the same month, March 28th, a person whose name is uh, Andres Freund reported the backdoor. So he found he was the found this backdoor and reported to the kind of suitable place. And then the Red Hat assigned this vulnerability as a CV 2024-394. Then the, everything is clear. So the Geotan is revoked of the maintainer. And everything and everything goes on to kind of recover from that point. And two months later, May 29th, the clear versions are released finally. During these two months, the last calling was examined every commit from the Geotan and released the clean versions, like version 5.6.2, 5.4.7, The first patch that contains malicious code is like this. It's it's uh, submitted by the Gia, it's committed by the Giatan on the February 23. It just says add a few test files, and this comment contains the five binary files. And uh, two of the, these five files contains the malicious code in it. 
but it just says that it's just a test code, test archive files. Actually, the back door is stored in two locations. One is this test archive. Another is the trigger code that activates this payload. It's only included in the release tables. So that means that the Git repository contains the discussed test archives in the, these two files. And then the risk tables has a trigger code kind of the modified this um, configure script built to host.m4. That means that this risk tables are not created directly from the Git repository, but Jata modified these kind of some, these scripts in it and make it a release. Rest. So after that, this kind of incident is, uh, is um, you read, the multiple organizations has a response to, to the, this incident. The one is the Caesar. It's released on the April 12. It says that uh, there's a risk. It's, the risk is that created by the maintenance burnout, and next time we may not be as lucky. And also that the CISA uh, points out that there's a kind of responsibility for the consumers of the open source, open source software. Also the OpenSSF and OpenJS uh, responded with this. So the, this XUT's incident is not a single one, but there are many, many other cases that there are similar, that there are similar attempts, similar attacks, attack attempts. So it's calling the maintenance to be alert for the social engineering takeover attempts for the such kind of the behaviors or the attacks. Also, open source has a response like this, and uh, it says that it's rely, um, yeah, it's relying on the hero, that means that in this case, it's this Android front, is not a su sustainable and a reliable strategy. And also they pointed out that this exit backdoor was designed to only target distributions. The conditions necessary for implanting were only existing downstream in these distributions. And in summary, so, so why this attack was successful? There's, I think that there are three reasons for that, main reasons for that. One is that this attack is kind of a long time one. So as we, as we see, the, it, when the Jiatan appears was the, uh, October 2021, and it takes one year to, for Jiatan to become a maintainer. So Jiatan worked as a kind of innocent contributor as almost more than the one year. And then Jiatan served as an active maintainer for the one year after that, almost more than the one year for that, after that. So it's, and during this time, most of the Jiatan's activity is innocent. So it's very difficult for the other persons to um, their intentions. The second one is that uh, this attack targeted at the project with a single maintainer, but still it's linked to the kind of essential components in the systems like system D or the SSHG. And the third one is that the attack itself was a very sophisticated. I mean, the backdoor itself was a kind of sophisticated. So maybe the normal might want to inspect the, what is called the test binary artifacts, or the normal no one might want to check that if the test table is different from the contents of the Git repository. So it's kind of a bit hard for the, everyone. So how can we defend from such attacks in the future? It's kind of very difficult because it's, it's, there's no 100% solution for the, this kind of social engineering attacks. And especially that in this case, that when attacker pretends to respect the, and follow the open source development or the way of the open source. But I think that we can do something that can block the, such kind of attacks like the finding the projects that require more maintenance and contributions. And maybe the find, after finding them, assessing the reviews on this project 
or the finding suspicious activities when it's repository, or just having more attention for uh, so such repositories can be work as a broker for the attackers, potential attackers. Anyway, so I think that it's kind of the unfortunate that uh, there can be another case for the such attack. So I think that we have to evaluate, first find uh, projects that require kind of such weak repositories. In that case, we need some kind of tool that evaluates that open source repository, whether it is kind of well maintained or not. So on the next slide, as we will talk about how we can develop such kind of tool to evaluate open source repositories so that we can find this kind of weak repositories. So. Thank you, Shimasa-san. OK, next. I would like to talk about how we can evaluate repositories uh, which may be vulnerable to similar attacks. We focused on the Open Source Security Foundation or OpenSSF scorecard as an active repository evaluation metric. This is an open source project by OpenSSF and it automatically evaluates the security risks of open source project and gives score out of 10 for each of 20 check items. These are the check items, and each has a risk level. The risk level is used as a weight to calculate the project overall score, which is determined by a weighted average. I'm sure you all you know, all know this, but I'd like to remind you again, even if overall score is high, there is still a possibility of attacks related to some of the items. So we need to check each item in detail. Next, I will introduce some details about the metrics related to the XZUtils backdoor. First, the metric binary artifacts Evalu that evaluate whether the project includes binary files. The risk level is high because when a repository contains a binary artifact, it has a risk of being contaminated. Next, branch protection evaluates whether the project uses branch protection. The risk level is high because if branch protection is disabled, it has a risk that the repository updated unintentionally. Code review evaluates whether the project con conducts code reviews before a code is merged. The risk level is also high. Code review enables to detect an attacker trying to insert malicious code. Contributors evaluate whether the project has contributors from at least two different organizations. The risk level is low. Contributors from multiple organizations are important for good repository management. Maintained evaluates whether the project has been maintained for at least 90 days. The risk level, risk level is high. A project which is not active might not be patched. So how is the score of XDUtils? We can see it in web application easily. The current score is shown here. And we have two insights as shown here. First, the scores of code review and branch protection are still low. The risk level of these metrics are high. Incidentally, the code review metrics is calculated by the most recent changes have an approval on GitHub, or if the measure is different from the committer. Second, despite the high scores for maintained and binary artifacts, attacks related to them have occurred. As you know, the score by scorecard is just an indicator. 
and the final judgment is made by the user. However, we think there are some issues to find the next target repository. These are some of features of XZU2's backdoor attack and the corresponding issues on the score card. In the attack, the repository with single maintainer was the target. So first issue is maintenance flow is not evaluated. Now, contributor is determined by the number of contributor organizations, but isn't the number of maintainers also important? And isn't the load of on each maintainer also important? Second, review flow is not evaluated for whether it is defined and functioning. And binary files were used in the attacks. So, third issue is binary file is, was in the source repository, but it was not detected. I will explain the details or countermeasures for this below. To evaluate maintenance flow of open source project, we propose the number of committers, number of committers who have made three or more commits in the last 90 days. Specifically, we evaluated added, adding the number of maintenance as a new metric A. And we propose adding the world on each maintainer as a new metric B. Specifically, we evaluated the number of commits per maintainer. The results of the evaluation are shown on page 31. Next, to evaluate review flow of open source project, we propose adding a new metric, too. In this session, we will not propose a specific method, but we are considering designing metric based on another project evaluation method. For example, the best practice batch is a way for open source projects to show that they follow best practice. And it is included in scorecard. But it was few descriptions related to code reviews. And the crit criticality score has a metric of development flow, but it seems to have become inactive. It has some metric that measure the activity of the project. For example, commit frequency is calculated by average number of commit per week in the last year, and updated issues count is calculated by number of issues updated in the last 90 days. So why not use this project as a reference and add metrics for evaluating code reviews flow to the scorecard? We would like to discuss about this in this open source community. Finally, we will consider issues where binary file was in the source repository, but was not detected. Binary files were difficult to review, so they have the risk of being used in attack. So it is recommended that binary files be generated in code as much as possible. Then one solution is to check based on file extensions. Then what about the compressed files? used in like XZUtils backdoor. What is the best way? We would like to discuss about this in the open source community too. Okay, from here I'll explain the result of the evaluation of the proposed new metrics. We applied the proposed metrics to the current XZUtils and obtained the following results. Unfortunately, the number of committers who have made three or more commit in the last 90 days was only one. So the situation for single maintenance has not changed. And the number of commit per maintainer was as a load was 29. To understand the level of these figures, let's try applying them to other projects. 
The target project uh, build dependencies of system D because system D is one of the key components in modern Linux system. And libLDMA is also one of the dependencies of system, system D. We extracted the dependencies from the Fedora 40 RPM metadata and identified 42 repositories. This includes 19 items from GitHub and 23 items from others. As a result, we got three patterns of insights and issues. First, first pattern is the maintenance system is weak. Here are the metric A and B for some packages. For example, libcap have only one committer and commit per committer, commits per committer is 17. There is these, these are, these are the risk that there are these repositories be the next target of an attack. Next pattern is the not maintained. Here are the last commit timestamp metric A and B for some packages. For example, QR encodes last commit is September 2020. To repeat, these are repositories that system D depends on. Don't we need to support it? Final pattern is the repository is huge. Here are the metric A, number of commit, and metric B for some packages. Shiran has 191 committers and about 9,000 commit in last 90 days. We think the repository contains some project and it is difficult to monitor the maintenance flow of each project. Finally, these are some other insights and our challenge items. First, there are many repositories that don't use GitHub. And Squarecard has some metric that are only available in GitHub. Second, the committer of the commit made in GitHub Web UI becomes GitHub. That will cause problem with the maintenance flow evaluation. Finally, when evaluating the maintenance flow, should we evaluate it both of commits and pull requests? Can a commit committer simply be considered a maintainer? These are a few cases where, where there are one committer and some reviewers. So we will continue, continue to challenge these issues, challenge to these issues. These are the conclusions of my part. We proposed two new metrics for Squarecard and applied the proposed metrics to the repositories that system, system D depends on. And there are uh, still a few challenges left. And we would like to work on applying the proposed metrics to scorecards. So please continue to discuss this topic, about this topic with us. That's all. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you for listening. Any questions or comments, please? Ah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, if you could go to slide 34, um, I have a question. So you are assuming here that a, a project that does not have any commit in the last three months or 90 days is unmaintained. I would not sign that. I mean, there may be projects that are just done. Maybe it uh, is valid to have this in combination with, let's say, open issues. If there are open issues that are not handled in the last three months, then that may be true. Thank you. Hmm. All right, thank you for the comments. Yeah, I think that it's reasonable because that it's just having the no comments does not necessarily mean that it's not maintained. But uh, actually, that if that uh, one kind of the 
risk of that, uh, this kind of the repository that has no comments in it for the long time is that maybe no one is watching that repository. It's, that means that if I just the one comment in that, I mean the, so maybe that the number of the, the reviewers that involved in that repository was decreased as there's no comment or the kind of no activity in that. In that case, that if, even if just having the no comments for the long time can have some kind of the risk for that uh, not watched or the allowing some kind of the, this kind of nasty comments into that repository in the future. Thank you for the talk. Uh, two questions. So first of all, have you um, approached the working group responsible for these scorecards with these suggestions? Actually, not yet. We are just uh, discussing on that kind of these metrics. And we'd like to first and think of that, uh, how can we move, kind of fit these this metrics into the scorecards architecture and uh, yeah, something. So if we agree on that, we'd like to discuss with that uh, working groups. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably a good idea to involve them early. I've worked with them in the beginning and they're really helpful people. I think they can probably help you. The second question is, so you showed the CVS score and you probably did not score it, but do you have any idea why the scope is changed? That seems wrong to me. I don't think that makes sense. They probably just wanted to get to the 10 value. Do you know why? I'm not sure about that, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank So I do have a comment on your timelines. You missed the most important piece of that timeline, which is when the attack was actually detected. So the time between release and detection was about a month. Yeah. And that's actually, in terms of an attack by a nation state that was two years in building, not a bad result. And we should, in some senses, celebrate this. So the problem with what you're proposing and the scorecard-based approach is they're all what are called static security defenses. If you're a nation state, your main job of all of your hackers is to look at the static security defenses we have and find the holes that we don't have inside those defenses. And that's so you can bet your bottom dollar that whatever you come up with, somebody will be paid for lots of money and lots of people to try and penetrate it. So the other thing that our ecosystem relies on is things called dynamic defenses. Dynamic defenses are basically people playing around with the code and actually finding problems. A dynamic defense was how this was detected. And open source is actually a system that really encourages dynamic defenses of code because it encourages people to play with the code, play with everything, and then if they get some odd result that looks strange, they report it, they try and tease it out, and they try and do everything else. That's how this was detected. So in some senses, this whole episode is actually a celebration of how successful open source is at encouraging people to deploy dynamic defenses and get detected. And I think one of the things we should do with all of these security foundations is they all concentrate on static defenses because that's what pleases corporations. But we do need a lot of support for the dynamic defenses, the odd person who'll play with the code, encouraging people to play with the code, encouraging people to think differently about how the code actually works. And I think the one thing we could do with OpenSSF is actually try and increase this uh, focus, or actually just give it some focus on the dynamic defenses that we have in open source. Mm. Sorry, C comment rather than question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the comments. Yeah, I think that's yes, right. And uh, this, I think that this, and uh, using the this scorecard, I mean the static score, is that uh, kind of finding that. Uh, Reports that needs kind of help with a dynamic watch or something like that. So I think that this kind of combining the two. Dan Sorry. Dynamic is almost impossible to measure. How good are our dynamic defenses? Yeah. That's why everybody concentrates on the static. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, it was dynamic that found this, and that's what we really need to be trying to encourage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much.